We are, um, we're live and recording. Okay, um, thank you for anyone who's out in the public waiting room for waiting patiently. We had a bit of a Zoom glitch, um, but we are now on to the Joint Committee, uh, Capital Planning Committee on March uh, 4th. And if Sean will put up the agenda, what while um, he's putting that up, because we're conducting this meeting virtually, I need to make sure that all the committee members can hear me and be heard. So I'm going to go across the screen as I can see it and just call out names and let me know whether everything is working for you. Alex? Yes. Um, Mandy? Present. Tammy? Yes. Andy? Present. Carrie? Present. Okay, so that, uh, that um, you know, the committee members are, who are here, Carrie had let me know, I think Carrie, you said you're gonna be leaving early and then Peter's gonna be joining late, but in any case. Yes. We're gonna um, be swapping. I'm gonna leave around eight o'clock. Okay. So, um, Sean, if you put up the agenda, we can go right into the first um, uh, item on the agenda. We're doing police, then fire, then public works for those in the public. And we'll take uh, public comments after we go through all the presentations and the councilors have a chance, uh, the committee members have a chance to go back and forth with questions. Um, this is being recorded and we po are posting the recording. So if anyone wants to go back and look at it, they can watch it. And the minutes, um, to the extent we can, are going to put the Zoom link also so people can both look at the minutes and go backward. Um, I just want to say one thing about the minutes. Um, I sent a draft, um, somewhat expanded draft on what Peter had done to everyone tonight because I wanted to make sure we captured the questions that we had asked uh, last time, Sean sent me a list of what he had in his notes. So if anyone sees that there was something that we wanted more information on that are not captured in the minutes, just please let us know. Um, so in the minutes, you'll see we asked for more information on several different items last week. And we'll do that again um, at the end of this meeting. And, I, and I'll try to, try to get that list back to people. So I think we can go right into... Um, the first group, Sean. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, police are going to be presenting first. So I'll turn it over to Scott um, to walk us through his projects for this year. And then um, we can see if there's any questions. OK, great. Um, can everybody hear me well? Yes, I can. Thank you, Kathy, and, and to the rest of the Joint Capital Planning Committee. So I will be presenting for the two items, or which amounts to six items for the police department, uh, an item to IT slash communications, and then for animal welfare, uh, all are which under my purview. So starting off with the police department, um, capital request we have um, on the list are four vehicles. Um, typically in a, in, a, in a normal year, we would request three vehicles each year. And then every fourth year, we request four vehicles for replacement. Um, last year, I think everybody knows there was probably no capital items that were granted. So this is a four year capital request for four vehicles. Um, the project cost is $260,000 which is $55,000 per vehicle with setup cost. These are all hybrid vehicles, um, which is a new request. We've, we have hybrid vehicles in our fleet now, which are all administrative vehicles. This is the first time we've had a request for patrol vehicles, which are hybrid, which is a good sign that we're transitioning in that direction. Um, these will replace four vehicles that um, typically we try and replace these vehicles around 100,000 miles. Um, this will replace a 2013 vehicle with 126,000 miles, a 2014 vehicle with 90,000 miles, 
which will be over 100,000 by the July 1st um, deadline. A 2017 vehicle that has a 102,000 miles on it currently. And then a 2001 vehicle, which has 101,000 vehicle, or excuse me, 101,000 miles on it as well. So those are the vehicles that will be replaced if these are granted through the, the, the committee request. Um, again, uh, the good news is that these are all going to be hybrid vehicles. This is relatively new when it comes to the patrol vehicles. Um, so this is a good sign that Ford, GM, and Dodge, which are the majority of the vehicles that um, submit bids to police vehicles are all transitioning over to hybrid vehicles. So we're finally getting to the point where we are um, transitioning to hybrid patrol vehicles. We've been many, many years where we've had hybrid for administrative vehicles. So that's a good sign. Um, and Sean, do you want me to just keep going with, with all our requests? Yeah, why don't you keep going through the rest of them and then we'll, we'll stop for questions. Okay. And then the um, second request is the replacement of two um, of our in-car video systems. Uh, this is, we've been, we've had in-car video systems in our cruisers for 22 years now. We're, I think the first police department in Massachusetts that had in-car video systems. So we continue to, to uh, replace those as needed. And this is just a upgrade and replacement of older in-car video systems that we've had in place for many, many years. This allows us, these systems allow us to video and audio capture all of our police stops, which protects both the police officers involved and the public and, and makes for good transparency. So this is something that we've been doing pretty consistent for the last, um, you know, 20 some odd years where, says you know, it's like every other thing that uh, involves IT matters, they wear out, they transition over to newer and better products. And so this is a upgrade and replacement of those systems. And from the police perspective, um, that is the only request we are making. Uh, we have additional requests from IT slash communications and police, which is an upgrade to our um, networking of the, our communication system. So this is a transition from uh, telecommunication systems that we lease to now the, um, and let me make sure I get this correct. So um, our public safety radio communications, which involves a little bit of police slash fire class EMS. Um, most of those costs through the years have been lease equipment through AT&T and that sort of thing. And I think most of the people are aware that we are now currently switching over to a fiber optic network, which is ongoing as we speak. So this is part of that replacement system, which um, will no longer necessitate that we lease this equipment, but we will now own this equipment. So the, the cost will be foreseen in that in the years to come. Um, and then the only other item on the police on, on which I oversee is the um, animal welfare um, budget. And that's a request for a replacement vehicle for animal welfare, Carol Hepburn. She's got a vehicle that she's been driving. I think it's 12 years old. It's, um, it's breaking down. We've replaced a number of things on it. Um, it's on its last leg to the point where we rarely let her drive any further than about 10 miles from the station because it's just kind of, it's rusting out. It's getting old. It's an, it's an old uh, Ford pickup that, um, you know, it's just, it's breaking down and it needs to be replaced. So those are the costs that are associated with her replacement vehicle. And uh, that is for $55,000. So that's kind of where we're at. 
Yeah, and I'll just add one thing um, for the animal control vehicle. We actually increased the amount a little bit from what was submitted um, in hopes of making that vehicle a hybrid as well. Yep, thank you. Uh, some of that will depend on whether we can find the the that vehicle is a little different than police cruisers, right, Scott? So we'll have to see if we can find a hybrid version that works for what she does. Yeah, correct, Sean. Um, Carol specifically requested a vehicle. Um, she'll, she'll get mad if I say this, but you know she's got an old pickup truck, and sometimes she has to lift animals either that are hurt or just need tra transportation, and she has to lift them up to an, into the pickup truck. And it, she's she's picked out the vehicle on her own, which is a um, it's a small van type that you see with like maybe auto parts delivery vans, if that makes sense. Um, it's very small, but it has the sliding door on the side. So it's very easy to just lift, lift things into it in and out, whether it be cages or animals, that sort of thing. So I'm kind of taking the lead on Carol's request on this. So um, why don't we um, take questions? Uh, comments. I'm looking, let me look, you can do it by raising your hand with the, the panelist button and I think I will see them on the screen. If I, uh, Mandy. Yes. Um, Andy can go first because I'm still formulating, but I didn't want to lose my chance with taking minutes. It's <laughs> so can you let Andy go first and then I'll, I'll work on it. <laughs> go for it. Yeah, no, I, uh, I was probably going to be a minor point because I think that uh, the chief already probably responded to it. But I recall the last time uh, there was discussion at JCPC meeting several years ago about the fact that uh, we needed a new animal welfare uh vehicle the one of the major concerns was that it be the a type of vehicle that uh carol could lift a heavy animal to or would have a mechanism to lift a heavy animal to so that she didn't endanger herself as she was trying to um assist an animal that might be uh, itself in danger so it sounds like you've solved that problem and we just need to have a proper description of the vehicle built into the process of um, acquisition. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Andy. So one issue we're having is trying to um, be consistent with new vehicle purchases. The one vehicle um, Carol's requesting, we haven't yet been able to find in a hybrid model. Um, and there's a four cylinder model, which the difference isn't that big a deal, but I know we're trying to be very consistent in how we go move forward with vehicle purchases with hybrid. Um, so we're having a little bit of difficulty finding that specific model that she requested in a hybrid model, but um, you know, we're working on it. I think we'll find something that the town will be agreeable and that is very cost saving. And again, the amount of driving Carol does this vehicle will outlast Carol probably. She'll hit me for saying that, but um, it, her vehicles tend to last 10 years plus, or at least the vehicle she's driving it, she's had for 10 years and that was purchased brand new for her. So, um, you know, it's, I, it'll be cost saving no matter how we cut it. Mandy. Okay, I've got it there. Many of my questions, uh, Chief, you answered regarding the animal welfare vehicle. So thank you for that. And thank you for coming in with um, a plan for hybrid options for the cruisers. I know, I think it was last year, but maybe it was the year before. I'm forgetting how far we got in our process last year. You talked about them coming out with hybrids and that you were really looking at them. So it's great to see that they did come out with them um, and that it you believe that it's a possible way for us to actually go in terms of um, you know safety and and usability and and you know all of the stuff you know longevity and stuff that we look at in purchasing vehicles, um, in car video systems and yep. you know Paul's not going to be too surprised at some of my questions and I don't expect full answers right now. Um, as you know, I'm a sponsor of a surveillance tech bylaw um, in the council, so 
um, you know, I'm looking at these and, and I have some questions that aren't necessarily JCPC related, but I'm going to take the opportunity um, and I don't need full on in-depth answers, but I'm, I'm just curious about some stuff. Um, what is the policy on the use of these? You know, you, you mentioned, I think, in your report that um, they capture all police stops. So is it any time the cars that, that the police officers leaving the car to deal with someone in the public, they, the policy is to turn them on? And do we have that written somewhere? Um, or does the officer have discretion? Um, and the other question I had was release and access, really. You know, um, do we have a written policy on who, who in town has access to those videos um, and the data from them, who in the public or other government agencies can request access and the circumstances under which they might be given access. Um, I don't need to know what they are. I'm just curious whether we have those policies. <laughs> so yeah, that, good, that's a great question. And I expected there would be some. So when it comes to in-car video, we have very specific policies on that and how they're used. The police officers themselves don't have access to when and when they can turn those on and off. So um, once they turn the blue lights on and stuff, they go on and they don't have the ability to turn those off. And uh, they have very specific, um, we have very specific policies um, on, you know, the audio and video distribution of that stuff. So most, most times it's used for, um, the district attorney's office when it involves, you know, drunk driving arrests, that sort of thing. Um, we do get public requests from time to time for those. They, it is a public, um, it is a public document, so to speak. So if people want access to that, they have access to that. If somebody, if for instance, we pulled you over and you got stopped for speeding and you wanted to see that, you would have access to that. Um, it is not kept for longer than, and Gabe, correct me if I'm wrong, is it 10 days? We have the storage capacity to uh, hang on to it for uh, a little bit longer than that. Okay. Um, uh, it's, it's actually 30 days that we can hang on to it. And um, again, just to reiterate what the chief was saying in terms of accessibility, when it's activated, the officers don't have any there's no method for them to alter in any way. And we only have specific uh, supervisors that do have access to the video recordings uh, if they needed to be disseminated. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, the other good news is we were notified and I'm going down the road because I know we've been talking about hybrid vehicles for a long time, but Ford Motor Company, which is our supplier of vehicles and others. Um, they've notified us within three years, we'll probably be all electric. So I think that's a really good sign as well, which kind of shocked me, but we've been told that um, they, they think within three years, we will all be driving a fully electric patrol vehicle. So that's a good sign as well. Chief, if I could just add uh, folks, um, myself and Doug Geary, who's in charge of our fleet. We went and tested out a lot of these hybrid vehicles and they've come a long way. Um, Ford has made a huge effort in really focusing on law enforcement vehicles with these hybrids. Uh, so they're really designed for police officers and its use. Um, they're really quite impressive and the chief is correct. Within three years, uh, the technology is just gonna advance dramatically in our favor. So I'm, I'm looking to see if there are any, I had a couple questions. So I'm just looking to see if anyone else's hand is up. Um, uh, one is on uh, the public radio fiber, uh, Chief Livingstone, and it may be one that has to be for later, but um, as I read the short paragraph on it, um, we get a pretty good payback on this. You, you listed that it's $9,000 a year to rent it and the cost is in the 80 to 85,000. So uh, what I want to know is it's, we're using UMass and the top uh, top of the library, the way it was described. Um, could this be even lower if we're tapping into what they're doing as part of their um, uh, partnership with the town of Amherst? So Peter, Peter sent in, could it be 
70,000. And I don't know what was behind his question of just throwing out another number. So, so it's sort of a question of, um, can we do more with the fact that they have a pretty sophisticated system and we're at least having a locational link up? Um, that was my question on that one. So if I understand it correctly, um, Kathy, it's, are we paying something for the setup on the library system and can that be reduced through negotiations with town and gown? Is that what, basically what it is at? Yep. Um, Lindsay, you know, um, because we do coordinate a lot of our communications, we piggyback with the fire department. And I know um, our IT people and Lindsay work pretty close together. So Lindsay, is that something you would have an answer to? Yeah, I think so. Um, I've worked closely with uh, Doug Geary and um, Sean Hannon from IT on this project because it really is joint fire and police. Um, to answer your question in short, Kathy, I don't think there's any savings to be had there because I don't believe we're paying UMass for access there. Um, all of the costs in the proposal are uh, technical. You know, it's to buy equipment and, and uh, uh, things like that and, and the installation. I don't believe we're actually paying for the space. What we're actually buying is, as the chief said, all the radios currently for police and fire are hooked into uh, phone lines. Verizon or it used to be AT&T phone lines uh, through an interface in order to switch those radios over to the town's fiber that's being put in, um, you need a different interface. So for each radio, we have to get a different, think of it as a modem basically, that goes from the radio to the now uh, fiber network instead of the phone lines. And then the savings are realized because we no longer have to pay the outrageous uh, monthly rental fees for those phone lines. The other part of this is uh, right now, the radios at the Tower Library for police are um, basically out in the open in a uh, HVAC room um, UMass has a nice uh, uh, protected space up there, a radio room basically for their police department. And they're allowing Amherst Police and Amherst Fire, again, I believe at no charge to move their equipment into that room. So it's better protected, has generator backup, uh, et cetera. So P Peter just joined us. Peter, I asked your question about 70,000, but I wasn't sure what was behind it. Just on a, is there any room for on, on the, um, the radio fiber, yeah. So if you wanted to follow up, you had sent that in to me. Yeah, no, I'm just looking at high priced items and wondering if we peel, peel them back a little bit, um, are they still viable? I'm, it's a general question I'm, I'm curious about with a lot of stuff, not just uh, the police stuff. Yeah, I believe in this one, as the chief said, this, this is based on an actual quote with our radio vendor, Goose Town Communications, to do the work necessary to move all the police and fire radio equipment uh, over to the fiber from the phone lines so we get that savings and move the equipment into the UMass uh, hardened room up there. You know, just the, the savings, the $9,000 annual, that's out of operating budget, correct? I mean, somewhere, somewhere in the large town operating budgets, police and fire. I defer oh, yeah. to, uh, to um, John, but I believe that's the case, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, I think that was my main question. Um, the, just on you listed your cars and the car replacements, one of them, I think you said only had 90,000 miles, but you're going for, maybe I misheard it, um, but you're going for replacement of four. So I just had a question of, is the judgment of which four, aside from mileage, are they at the point of falling apart, having frequent repairs you know, on, on the fleet? Yes, Kathy. So typically, and that's where we kind of do the cutoff is at the 100,000 mile mark. And what we found is we may get a little bit more miles out of them. Um, you know, like I said, some of them have 126, 102. The things that tend, start tending to break down at 100,000 miles are the expensive items like transmissions and, and the engines themselves, because not only are there um, 100, plus miles on them, but we also have to consider the idling time, um, which is typically about double of what the mileage is. You know, so if you're at a, uh, an accident scene, for instance, that vehicle's running idling the same amount of time that it would be, you know, driving normally. So, um, 
you know, I can't give you a definitive answer that this is going to, you know, everything's going to break down at 100,000 miles, but typically yep. where we, yeah, major breakdowns is a little bit over 100,000 miles, and it's usually high ticket items that are breaking down, transmissions and engines. Do you have any um, sense with a hybrid? We, we have a hybrid, um, and it has a lot more than 100,000, but the th and the idling is different because you switch you switch off the gas, but um, what about the longevity or they aren't too long, too soon on the mark to know it, that the things that tend to go are like the battery. You may have to replace a battery after a certain amount of time. So I'm, I just don't know whether, what the switchover will mean about the frequency of replacement. And I don't either. Um, we know, you know, these are hybrid electric. So yes, when they're idling, they're gonna be running off electric battery. Um, so I don't have an answer to that. It's going to be interesting to see how these, and, and um, maybe people who do own hybrid vehicles can give even me an idea. I'm not even sure if Ford knows how these, because there's a lot of items that are run off these that, which are electric. You know, we have in, we have in the in-car video systems, we have computers, we have flashlights, we have AED, you know, life-saving equipment that are all hooked into this. Um, you know, so there's a lot of equipment that's running off the batteries. Um, the other thing that Ford does nice for police vehicles specific is um, it's all heavy duty braking systems and the crash systems are heavier duty than, so we're, they're rated higher for front end collision and rear end collision um, up to 80 miles per hour, which is different than what you and I can buy or purchase. Um, so those are the types of things that are typically more expensive for us. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I don't have any other questions and I'm looking, I don't see any other hands up. So I think that does your, your items. Thank you very much. Okay. So next up is the um, fire department. And before we go to them, I just wanted to point out one thing. I was um, speaking with um, Assistant Chief Stromgren earlier to, um, yesterday, actually. And there's one section in the capital improvement program where there's like the descriptions underneath the um, projects. And there's a section there that was from last year's request and it was actually updated for this year's request. So there's uh, a place where um, Assistant Chief Stromgren will point out where it's different. Um, it, it's in regards to the replacement schedule and how many we get, um, how much we are aiming for in terms of how long they will last. And so I just wanted to point that out before they get going. But with that, I will turn it over to Chief Nelson. All right, thanks. And Chief, I'm gonna put the, I'll share the screen now for you for the- Okay, thing. cool, thanks. Yeah, uh, what, as, as Sean, Sean said, there's uh, what, you, what you have in, in your book is gonna be a little bit different from what, from what we wrote. Up. This is this is the most uh, up, up, up to date for, for version. So, so so for us, uh, uh, we will start start off with our mobile mobile radio radios. It's a forty five thousand dollar cost, uh, and this is all this is part part of a multi year pro, pro, project that that we we've been do, 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 do doing here for a while to 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 replace places or radio that they reach the end the end of their use life. Uh, their uh, mobile, mobiles are are the base radios that that we put put, put in our, our vehicles. So, and right right now the one uh, what, what we're looking to replace is about 20, 20, 20, 20 year, year, years old, and they're not really supported by 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 their original manufacturer. So, another another feature is that. Uh, the big watch watchword, actually, since nine 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 eleven, has has been in the inner uh, uh, operability. The ability for us us to speak speak, speak to different agencies seems that's that's what you you'll you'll find in 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 the newer radio. So, so we're and we're looking to uh, to to replace five five. Or more. Next up, uh, it's a four forty thousand dollar request to to replace uh, uh, an ongoing going replacement schedule of our uh, the tech 
protective gear. That's uh, coat, helmet, 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 helmet bunk, bunker pants, boots, that, that type, type of thing. Stand, standard is uh, 10, 10, 10 years, 10 year player replacement. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that, the, that, that we have, we have to remain cog, cog, cognizant of is when, when we go out, go out to the train, when, when we go go to the Mass Fire Fire Duty Academy, they require, require that our that our gear is in is in is in compliance, or we can't take part in, in the training. And there's and you know uh, there's there's wear, there's tear, there's just environmental factors, sun, 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 sunlight as well. But that 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 will tend tend to break break down material over a period period of time. So. Uh, and we've, we've asked, we've used, we've asked, asked, asked for the same, same amount down, 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 down through, through, through the years. Stop the, the up, the up and down. There have been some, some years where, where, where we've used, used, used it all, and somewhere where, where, where we have, it. I haven't. But we've seen where it, it's good, good to get a consistent amount, amount, amount to work, work from. And what this this will do um, is allow 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 us to purchase about fifteen sets of uh, protective gear each each year, and we and 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 that key and that that up that will allow us to stay, stay on our our ten ten year replacement plan. It's not just our per, permit for us, but we have our call for us and our students students that that need that the that, that need need gear. That's all, almost. Uh, 100 to, uh, per personnel. Oh, uh, our next next item is our uh, our lap lap laptops for for our uh, our our our, our, our ambulance. It's about fifteen thousand 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 dollars request. We use we use these to do do our favorite patient care 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 re re reports. They're they're blue blue. Bluetooth enabled, so we can tra transmit those reports reports to the, uh, the, uh, the hospital. Plus, it ta it, uh, it ta takes care care of trans trans transmitting our bill billing information to 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 account accounting and and it's for uh, data, data, data analysis as, as well. We 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 also run, run uh, so our two front front line engine, engines run uh, run as pair pair paramedic engines we can do every, everything that that we we can do in the and and let's accept transport so we so we, so we need we need to be able to be, be able to do the same 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 type type type, type of data, data work that we would do on an M, and let's that we need to be able to do that on the, on the on the, on the fire, fire fire engine so and we've been We've been looking at a, at a three three year size cycle uh, replacement size size cycle. They they get a lot a lot of a lot a lot of uh, work here and there out you know because we, we don't we don't we don't just leave leave them in the in the in the trucks we'll pull 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 them out and they're right right there at the at the at the scene. So uh, lastly, uh, we're looking at uh, we, we, we want, we'd like 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 to replace replace an engine or a pump pumper. Uh, it's, 450,000 request. Uh, the stand standard is 20, 20, 20, 20 years for uh, for a fire truck, any type type of type of fire truck. The one we want to replace is a 1999, so that's about 20, 22 years year, years old. Per se. And uh, as 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 we've said, you know, 20, 20, 20 years. Is 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 the typical life life lifespan for a frontline and, and, and engine, and that and as 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 we replace place it, the new new one would become our engine one, which is here down downtown, and then and then 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 we we shift shift the uh, shift shift the, the next the next next the next one down to 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 a reserve, and then for use by by our call force and and our student force. Excuse me. Uh, one one end is an interesting, interesting thing. Uh, Chief Chief Wilkinson was talking about uh, the new type technology uh, with high 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 hybrids. What this truck 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 could have is an and it's called an anti idling uh, tech, technology. We um, a lot a lot of our our work is not going up and down 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 the street. It's being on 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 scene and I I idling for. Time what this this would, would do after after a seven seven, seven period of time, 
it it would shut shut the truck 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 down, and uh, and and of course that that's that's going to save save on fuel and and reduce the, the, the emissions. So, so that's a, that's some something. It's it's been slow to come to to the fire fire fire, fire service, but it's kind of coming. It's kind it's it, it, it's coming down down the road. And one of the nice things about some some something like this, there's a state state bid bid list. And some something like and it, it cut, cuts down the uh, acquisition uh, time and just all the, all, all the rigor and all that to, that to, that you'd have to have to go 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 for it. Again, the, the bid the bid the bid is all already set. The bid spec, specs are all are all, are all, are all because it's done it's done it's done by by by, by the state. And then, uh, Assistant Chief uh, Strom Strom going to end on 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 there here as well. The kind of, if you need need to really dig down 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 deep in, into any of these three questions. Yeah, I would just I would to expand on the um, anti-lighting technology a little bit because it's different than a hybrid, um, like what they're talking about for the explorers. First, I just want to make a note: Chief Livingstone was answering the question about the um, reliability, longevity of those vehicles. Um, I can't okay. imagine that we have a 2009 um, Ford Escape here at the department. It's our fire inspector vehicle. And we've put the least amount of money into maintenance on that than any vehicle we have. Um, we've done oil changes, tires once, and I think we replaced the um, regular battery, not the hybrid battery once. So it's been an incredibly reliable vehicle now that it's uh, 12 years old. So I guess that's a good sign. Um, the anti-idling technology for emergency, large emergency vehicles, um, unlike hybrids like the Explorer for the police or the Escape, where you pull up to a traffic light and it you know, shuts down the motor, as you're probably aware, and uh, then kicks in again when it needs to. For large emergency vehicles, ambulances, fire trucks, it's a different concept. It does not affect the driving time at all. You're still driving under the diesel motor power. Um, but what happens is when you get to the scene and put it into park, um, then the anti-idling technology kicks in. Um, ambulances, fire trucks in particular can spend hours, especially the fire trucks, hours and hours idling um, on a scene. Um, and unless you're pumping water for the pumper, you don't need that big diesel motor running. So the anti-idling technology basically on the scene shuts down the diesel motor, switches to the battery backup to run the emergency lights, uh, heat, AC, <laughs> radios, other equipment, and of course monitors all those parameters and it kicks the motor back on again if necessary to bring the power back up, the heat, the AC, et cetera. Um, the interesting thing about that type of technology is you would think the larger the vehicle, the much, much larger hybrid system you need. And that's not really the case because you're not trying to move the vehicle down the road with this technology. You're just trying to keep the lights, the radios, the heat and the AC going. So for a large fire truck, it really doesn't have to be that much bigger a system than any, any ambulance. Uh, the ambulance that we have on order right now, that was an emergency procurement last fall, you may remember because one of our ambulances uh, died, was unrepairable. That is, has been purchased with the anti-idling technology. So that will be here this summer. That, the anti-idling part of it was purchased using grant money. So we will have our first vehicle here this summer with that technology. And as the chief said, when we buy this um, fire truck, we can incorporate the same technology. Uh, the latter truck that did not make it to capital this year, but it's out there in the wings needing to be replaced, our 33-year-old ladder truck. When we revisit that next year, um, that can also have that same technology in it. So we can, as we buy new vehicles for the fleet, we would look to add that to every vehicle to try to meet the town's goals. Thank you. Um, uh, questions, comments from the committee? Andy has his um, hand raised. Andy. Yeah, hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, this may be a question for Sean and not for uh, the chief and assistant chiefs. Uh, where are we as far as our ability to charge um, any of the proposed purchases to the um, ambulance fund this year? And um, has the ambulance fund been affected by the number of uh, calls that we've had? Yeah, so Sonia would probably be the best to answer that, but I can speak to it a little bit. So the the ambulance that we did buy, the um, 
the anti-idling piece was from the grant, but the rest of that ambulance was from the ambulance fund. Sonia took taken a look at that and determined that we had enough um, to to purchase it out of that fund and still have enough to support the budget coming up for the FY22. Um, so it was affected by the pandemic, and I'm sure actually Assistant Chief Olmstead can speak to it a little bit. He sees the volume um, on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a couple things at play. So when UMass left, that affects the calls. Um, but then we also did a study and, and had some change to the to the um, rates that we use for billing. So maybe Assistant Chief can speak to that a little bit more about what he's seeing now. Yeah, I mean, the other question that goes with it, obviously, is that uh, to the extent that these purchases are priorities for the town and recommended by the town manager and less money is available for the ambulance fund, then uh, it needs to come out of the uh, taxpayer portion of the capital budget, which affects the entire plan. So I just was uh, trying to see how it all ran together. Yeah, and, and one thing before I turn it over to Assistant Chief. So all of these are coming out of um, the taxpayer portion, the, the projects that were discussed. Um, the large um, pumper is, there's a couple projects that are on there is slated for borrowing. And that is one, just so you probably saw it when you looked at the plan. Um, but that is one of the vehicles that we would potentially borrow. I think I have it for five years in the projections um, because of the cost. Jeff, do you want to speak a little bit? I just want to make sure Andy's all set. You know, I was just going to point out that that kind of a vehicle probably is not legally permissible for the ambulance fund. It's more of the, some of the uh, radio equipment that's been talked about. Maybe a portion of other vehicles, but anyway, thank you. So just to kind of follow up, yes, the uh, particularly the fall where the students weren't here um, at the colleges, that definitely affected our call volume. Um, and we certainly see the uptick, even with the limited number of students who've come back to campus, you can already see the uptick of, of calls. Um, before COVID, we'd switched over to a new uh, billing fee structure. Uh, and that had actually significantly raised uh, some rates and brought us in better balance with most of our neighbors in the uh, Hampshire County region, uh, ambulance services that were similar to ours. So it's been a little bit of an offset where the higher rates uh, are being, you know, helping offset the lack of calls, but it, uh, it'll be a little while before we sort of get back to our normal, uh, both volume and uh, seeing all the benefits of the increased rates. Probably. Yeah, we're, we're hoping to start getting some trend information. You know, if, if next year UMass comes back in full strength, um, Jeff, I don't think we've seen a full year yet with the new rates with things at, at normal levels, right? No, I think we started end of January, February with the rates and then COVID comes in March. The students go home, you know, shortly thereafter um, and don't come back after spring break. And then we went through a period of time where people were, we're pretty nervous about going to the hospital, honestly, in April and May and in a bit of June. Uh, nobody really wanted to go to the hospital. Um, so they didn't call us unless they really, really needed to. Um, and then we didn't have the students in the fall. So you do see those numbers affected um, by that. But at the same time, as soon as the students came back uh, in their limited format, there's certainly plenty of them live off campus as well. Um, you can see the volume starting to come back. So there's a strong belief that, you know, next fall things will look a little more, I won't say normal, but like they used to be. I'm looking for um, other questions. I have um, one on a smaller item um, on the laptops. It's $15,000 for three laptops, which um, is relatively high for laptops, depending on what the laptop has in them. So I didn't know whether these are special um, come pre-programmed to have various kinds of uh, connections and uh, also a laptop versus a tablet as if you're carrying it around outside. So it's just, it's a question on the technology that's being used. So yeah, we've, as we've done this, we've actually had a transition over to a different uh, electronic reporting system. And we actually need the same amount of money 
but actually need more laptops because as you see, this was an unfunded uh, request from last year. The new uh, EPR system um, doesn't need quite as much computing power that the old ones did. And so those old ones were almost five, were basically $5,000 a piece. Those were solid state circuitry, uh, military spec type of grade because of the wear and tear. And I needed a computer that could almost basically run the system uh, individually. We switched over to one that is cloud-based and needs a little less of that solid state circuitry. But instead of needing three, I need more like six because we usually have five ambulances going, the two EFR engines, and would like to have a one spare um, so that we can sort of keep the system up and running because occasionally things break and you want to keep all the um, vehicles going and the electronics going so we can do patient care reports and the billing that's associated with that. Um, so we are looking at a tablet format that hopefully will be a little bit less, but it's, like I said, instead of needing three that we needed last year, I'm looking at really needing six. I already have uh, two, two that are down and out completely, one that's not working very well. And, and uh, the fact that we have a fifth ambulance that's not in service because the engine's blown um, has given me a little bit of a break on needing, you know, I can't replace that, that laptop right now. I don't have the means to do it. Um, so we're, we're kind of hoping to hang on to July 1st to, uh, to make this all work. Okay. Thank you. Um, anyone else? I don't, I don't see any other questions. So I, um, my one request would be the one pager that you showed that had some additional information on it, if we could just get it sent to Sean. So um, we, can, we, can, we can send, send, send that, yeah, that, that would be great. That out, sure. not, not a problem. That'd be great. Thank you very much. I think that's, uh, that's this batch, right, Sean? So then yeah. we're on. To now we're on to um to the Department of Public Works. Guilford, are you there? To there, there he is. Maybe there you go. Am I? All right. So got my two two screens going here just to make sure I get all everything in here. So for our, our capital, we'll start with the actual roads and the sidewalk type stuff. The, um, our first request is um, stormwater management program. This is a, a request. Actually, our first one is transportation plan. We actually have requested every few years of, of some of money to help with the transportation issues we're working on, um, using it for either some site work or survey work or some type of data collection. Um, we're asking for 50,000 for this year. Um, our next request is um, stormwater management program. We've been asking for a small amount. We had, we didn't request anything last year and this coming year, we're going to need to do, actually do some actually sampling and testing of the waters that are come out of our discharges. So we put in a rough number of 100,000 for that. Um, that's basically to build our baseline for what we have to do next. Um, there's a, from town, from town funds, we're asking for $200,000 for sidewalk repairs around, around town. Um, last year, this money was used to redo Strong Street, Summer Street, and, um, we did a major repair on Woodlot on, in the Amherst Woods where there was some damage to the sidewalk there. We started working on North Pleasant Street last year, but we didn't finish. We ran out of the season. We'll start on Old North Pleasant Street this year. Um, we have a project to tie the sidewalks into Kendrick Park next, for this year as well. As we built, finish the Kendrick Park playground, there's no crosswalk between the neighborhood to the west and the, and the Kendrick Parks, we're gonna change the intersection at, ha at um, McClellan and Old North Pleasant Street so we can have a crosswalk and sidewalks that lead to the park. Um, we also used part of this money last year to put the sidewalk in that runs across Kendrick Park now. There's a nice wide sidewalk that goes from the east side to the west side. 
Um, so <clears throat> that's what we used last year. And like I said, Old North Pleasant Street and the intersection at McClellan and Old North Pleasant Street will be the first things we work on for this coming year, which actually will be money, actually will be 2021 money because our construction season runs different than your than the budget years. Um, we're still putting together the rest of the list for next this construction season. Um, I believe Amity Street will probably be on it. We'll probably replace the sidewalks on Amity Street. Um, tie that in with the work that the gas company did on Amity Street as well. Um, our next request is road repair. And this is this is town money for road repair. There's 850,000. And that'll be matched with the chapter 90 money, which is also on the list. If you'll see, it's 841,000 for chapter 90. Um, we're still finalizing the list of roads to do in the next um, construction season with this money. Um, so I, I'll have to send you that list a week or so after we finalize what we're, we're proposing to do. Um, we are asking for $450,000 to begin the final phases of design for the North Amherst intersection. Um, we won't use all that $450,000 on the finalizing the design. Um, that money will, will be to finalize it and then there'll be some money to start construction if we actually get a good design and we're ready to go and it's approved. Um, the next, uh, next item on our list is um, every, every year we ask for $12,000 roughly to uh, do street lighting lamping. It's basically going through and hitting the older, older photo cells and older lamp structures and replacing them. Um, so that's the, that's that list. And then our vehicle list, we're asking On the vehicle list, we have three vehicles we're looking to replace. Um, one's a one-ton dump that we use in the parks department. This is the, tr the truck you see driving around very early in the morning picking up trash. Um, it goes out seven days a week, picks up the trash. Um, the transmission's starting to slip on it. So if we keep the vehicle, we're gonna have to put money into a new transmission. It's 12 years old and has about, it has 76,000 miles on it as of the first of this month. Um, that's the first truck we're asking for. Um, it also has a special lift in it that we take the trash body off and we can put a sander body or a dump body on it for snow plowing when we do snow plowing. So it's not the same uh, body on the back of the truck. We'll keep the bodies. We're just replacing the truck and the lift that goes on the truck. The next truck is one of our big sanders. The truck we're replacing is a, is a 2006. It's an international. Um, it has 90,000 miles on it. It's um, not the most comfortable truck to drive. And since we have some newer ones, it doesn't get driven as much. It only goes out for the major storms right now. This truck that will, that's being replaced is, or this truck that we have is a uh, tier two, EPA tier two diesel engine. So the newer truck will be a, a higher, it'll be at least a tier four, if not the tier five um, EPA required emissions on it. And it will be a diesel. The last truck we're looking to replace is our, our sweeper. Um, the sweeper is a 2004, it's 17 years old. It only has 45,000 miles on it, but the sweeper's job is not to go out and drive around a lot. The sweeper goes out and puts along at three, four, five miles an hour sweeping. And it actually has two engines on it. It has the engine which moves the vehicle and runs part of the truck. And it has a second engine which runs the sweeper apparatus. The sweeper apparatus engine has already been replaced once about halfway through its life. We're gonna to have to replace that engine in another year or two if we keep the truck. And then the Sweeper has sort of a belt system and conveyor system, which every five to six years has to be replaced inside the truck. And we're up, we're due for another replacement, another two years. The bigger trucks, the sweeper and the international sander 
Um, when we say we're going to buy one of those and those are authorized in the budget for 2022, it takes about 18 months for us to get that vehicle. That's just the process lag inside the assembly plants now. Um, there is no longer the concept of just-in-time purchasing or manufacturing. Um, you can just-in-time purchase it, but then it shows up once they just-in-time finish making it, which is 18 months usually after you've put the order in. Um, so those are our, our big big uh, our big items on the capital plan. I don't think I've missed anything. Um, questions? And I'll just add real quick that the um, the street sweeper is the other vehicle that is proposed as a borrowing. Um, so the, the street sweeper and the, the fire truck would be sort of bundled in the, the current plan. Okay, I'm looking for uh, questions. Uh, so I, um, I can start out because I had several if, if I'm, I'm just making sure I don't. Oh, Peter's, yeah. Peter's yeah. Nose hand up. Peter, go. So. Yeah, um, so everybody's favorite lightning rod, uh, road repair and resurfacing. Here we are again. Um, so 850,000, so that's the number one item on the cash capital list. It's about a fifth of the, the cash capital. Um, and this is a great example for me um, in terms of how I try and contribute here because I have absolutely no expertise in what, in what you're talking about here. So I can't really evaluate it there, but so I just, I just kind of want your generalized feedback that like, say we knocked this back to 700,000, would, would our roads generally speaking still be safe and functional if, if we put 700 in as opposed to 850? If, if you, if you, the easiest, I guess the easiest way to say that is um, Henry Street, our estimate for paving Henry Street is about $852,000. And that's paving Henry Street all the way from Market Hill Road all the way to the S curves where it turns into Northeast Street. So at the prices that we have now, um, you're just reducing the, the amount of length you can pave. Um, does that answer your question better? So, okay, so say so you did that. It, like, can cars still go down the road? Is it still a safe road to drive on? Is it still a safe road to drive on? It's still a road to drive on. There may be more potholes and there may be um, more delaminations going on and you may need to drive slower or else you're gonna damage your vehicle. Um, it's, we, so we have rough. Can I add to go for, why don't you finish go for it and then I'll add to what you're saying. We have roughly about a 20 to $22 million backlog. We're doing another survey this year. That's gonna be part of what the work we do. And we'll have a better number on our backlog, but that's basically our backlog is about 20, 22 million. And so the one thing I was gonna add is um, we've had a strategy for a few years now, knowing that the four building projects are coming up um, that we wanted to make a major dent on the backlog of road projects. And so there's been a big investment in roads the last two years, and, and we maybe can get another year or two before some of those building projects start coming online, um, you know, if they get approved. So one of the reasons why you see it where it is is because we have intentionally been trying to chip away at that backlog of roads before we have other, other needs on the, the capital money in town. And uh, Aunt Peter, did you have a follow up on That's that a question? So I'm happy to come back. Okay, Andy. Yeah, actually, my, this is follow up on the same subject. Uh, my understanding has always been that there are several factors that affect the town economically if we don't maintain our roads adequately. And Chief, uh, Chief Stromgren is here to respond possibly to some of it, but one is that uh, people who drive on roads and if there are problems that they encounter, 
that we have failed to properly um, take care of, there is the potential for insurance claims against the town. The second thing is, is that um, our equipment and particularly our heavy equipment, which is uh, generally um, fire department equipment, uh, school buses and uh, some of the heavier DPW, we're gonna have wear and tear on those vehicles and that's gonna come back to affect the town economically. Uh, so for those reasons, as well as for just um, trying to um, address concerns of our residents um, and what they think is an important measure for them of quality public service, uh, it's, it's a real difficult decision to make to cut back on an ongoing road maintenance program. Anyone else on roads? Because I have a question on something else, but I wanna stay on roads if there are other roads and or sidewalks, I guess. Yes, Peter. Yeah, so I won't comment about uh, road resurfacing until we get to the very end and we're wrapping everything up again, but just to follow up on Andy's point, I, I completely agree with Andy that this is this is an important uh, investment that we need to make in the town and, and LaShawn's planning is absolutely reasonable and makes sense. Um, what I'm trying to do in general though, when I look at any of this stuff is is see, you know, how, how far can we turn the knob down until we get to a real pain point? Because I think it's pretty clear on the operational budget this year and potentially the next X number of years with the four capital projects, that the pain point is already there. And so it's, you know, we, we all value all of this stuff. It's not a matter of, should we do the roads? Of course we should do the roads. Uh, it's, it's, it's where do we, where do we strike that balance, right? So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that for some quality of life is impacted by the number of potholes, but for some other people, quality of life is impacted by what we're doing to the operations budget. And not just the schools and the operational budgets in the town. So that's just where I'm coming from from that point of view. I'm not suggesting that this is an irresponsible proposal, um, but you know, budgeting is a harsh zero sum game, and that's that's what we're here to do. Uh, that's certainly a true statement. Um, I have a question on two items. First, the small one, um, transportation plan. And then secondly, the North Amherst intersection. On transportation plan, I just want to understand how this actually works. So a couple years ago, there was a resident capital request that was put in for a sidewalk study on East Pleasant Street. And they first cross-checked with TAC to the Transportation Advisory Committee. And it was at the top of the list. And then the discussion with you, Guilford, was it could be that $50,000 could do the study and it became part of the transportation plan for that year, for that 50,000. I don't think that's been done, um, that study. So I wanna know how, how are the priorities set and um, it's written up in a JCPC report specifically for that year. So is it on a back burner and going to happen? Um, is there a, a list for each of those 50,000s each year of what the most likely is? And then is there some kind of rationale for when we shift? So it, I'll start just on that one piece. So yes, the 50, we do have 50,000 and we have it earmarked to do the survey work for East Pleasant Street. Um, it's slid a bit in the schedule. We've been working the original first priority for the TAC and I think they were still, they were called the TAC then the Transportation Advisory Committee was um, improving North Pleasant Street. Um, and we spent, we spent some other money on that and we've actually been working on that plan. We're actually ready to bring those plans forward this year and actually start working on the improvements on North Pleasant Street. So um, this year, this year, yes, we have to push the uh, East Pleasant Street uh, survey out. So we have that going. Um, the, the one thing that does happen is other, other little projects little ones pop up. Um, the Pomeroy and 116 intersection, we had another project that kind of emerged to, that we needed to work on in between. Um, those kind of step in there too and get in the way of us moving them all along. Um, 
but we we got them all going and then east pleasant street is is next to get a get some push on it um the fifty thousand dollars you're voting for now the tac will choose what they think their next priority is and we'll probably earmark that money towards working on that project and probably another project because i the, the projects they have right now are a little smaller in scope than doing a sidewalk all the way down East Pleasant Street. So just on, a, on staying just on the East Pleasant Street as an example, if we did that study, the cost you had uh, quoted in the $300,000 range to put in the sidewalk. So if we do a study and then I look out over the next five years and see the sidewalk budgets dropping, pretty dramatically from what you're asking for this year. I think it was the one that's dropping. Um, so it's the interaction. Um, yeah, so it's dropping to 75,000 and then 50,000 over the next several of the, when I'm looking out the five years. Um, so it's a question of how these interact that um, if one thing replaces another as one year it was the priority and then suddenly it wasn't the priority, but how do we have um, a systematic way of saying, this is what we're going to do next and make sure we budget for that next piece. So, so East Pleasant Street wasn't a priority over North Pleasant Street. Okay. East, North Pleasant Street was chosen first by the TAC to be their first priority project to work on. Um, East Pleasant was chosen as their second priority. I think they have a third now too. I don't know it off the top of my head. I, I'd have to look it up. So it wasn't like one of them, like it dropped off because it was replaced by another priority, the, the, this, this type of money. We do have other projects that come into the queue we have to work on that push projects back a little bit. That is what does happen. Um, as we do East Pleasant, we start coming up with a number, we'll start proposing that number for the actual number that will be in the, in the capital plan. And based on how the spending is going, we'll see if we have additional money to fit it into the capital plan. We may have to take some of the road money we have now or some of the chapter 90 money we have now and move it towards the sidewalk to do that sidewalk project and then do less paving on a road. And that is something we've done in the past. So. At this point in the game, there is a lot of, you have kind of what the immediate, the immediate ask is, and then there's a, a bit of a float in the future. And we just try to keep a number out there and then we work towards that number as we move along. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. And now I have a question on the North Amherst intersection. Um, $450,000 is this year's ask and next year would be 1.8 million the way it's sitting in this capital plan. So um, what is the 450 for? Because as you know, I mean, we've been following this, I'm up in North Amherst, so just full disclosure. And there's been several years ago, there was a community meeting about what to do with North Amherst. There were a couple of vignettes or uh, drawings, move the streets around, redirect them with traffic lights without, with traffic circles, with a mix of them. Then you had a survey, another $40,000 survey on what could be done. Um, and so there's a lot of interest on what might be the current thinking and would we spend money on designing something before we went out to say, this is what we're thinking of doing. That's that's my basic question because it um, when, I, when we went and we got the Mass Works grant with proposal and we looked at the designs that had been proposed with that because there had been some engineering work. It was not the same picture that was displayed to people about what we were thinking of doing there. So, so it's, it's a question of, does the plan for what we're going to do precede spending $450,000 to get to the detailed pieces? Um, a bit what you're doing with Pomeroy Lane, which is getting a lot of input before jumping in to say, this is what we're gonna do. So it's that, question, especially when I see the 1.8 million a year later. And these, Sean, these are listed as cash cap. They, they weren't listed as grants. No, they are, um, these are, that was the one thing I was gonna say real quick before Guilford um, answers your question is these are borrowings. So both both pieces, so not this, 
doesn't take away from the current year's cash capital. And these would have to go in front of the council for debt authorization before we had any money to spend anyway. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that these are both borrowings. So if it pushes a little bit later, it wouldn't matter because we have to go in front of the council anyway for a debt authorization. But, are, but does that mean you're not going for the Pomeroy we working on that intersection is almost entirely grant funded because you there was success. Yeah, in that, that one, there is no current, I mean, there's no funding in the capital plan for Pomeroy. Um, right, so I'm just asking about why not really push hard for a grant as opposed to $1.8 million, even if it's borrowing. I mean, if I convert 1.8 and 4, 450, it's what Peter's asking about. There's a, it's pulling from cash capital because- yeah, it, no. So we are, um, so we actually did talk about that and we, I think, do want to push for a grant. Part of what that money could be used for is to help um, further a design and to get some community input. Um, but we did talk about, that's, again, it's a borrowing and that's why it's sort of spread over two years, but we did talk about potentially going for a grant for that project as well. Um, but we are planning, since it is a capital plan for five years, we do have it on there um, as being a, as a project out there for us to consider. Gilford, do you want to talk a little bit more about sort of the next steps with that? So the next the next step, you kind of you kind of broach the whole subject of where we are with it. Um, our next step is to pull everything back together and see what we have and see where we're going, and then talk to people about where we want to go. Um, the issue is sort of like Sean says is, um, and what I've said earlier. Um, you're making the budget for 2022. Um, we kind of have the construction season moving for 2022 at this time already. You're authorizing money. Some of this money won't be spent until 2023 because it'll take us time to get there. But we need to kind of have something, some number we know is a number we can use and some authorization at some point for funds to, if it's not spent in the fall of 20 of 2021, 2021 or the winter of 2022 to finish up plans or to get plans going. Uh, we won't have anything if we, if we really have time and we really want to push this one forward this year. Um, if we decide if the, if the council decides they just want to put this project off and let it sit for a year and a half before we do anything else on it, then you could slide this out another year and, and set it up that way. But we've kind of lined this up as to be the next intersection we look at after the Pomeroy at 116. Um, asking the, putting it on the plan and asking for a little money right now doesn't mean we're not going to apply for a grant if a grant comes up and, or try to do that. That's always in the back of our mind. But if we don't plan for having money now and we just say, yeah, we'll apply for a grant and we don't get the grant, then you're moving the project out more and more years. So that's really kind of how it's, that's this is actually amazingly this is one of the first times we've done it this way usually we design every everything and then we try to hope to find money now we're trying to lay out yes we need a little bit of money and we need we think this is how much it is and schedule it in and then as other things if other money comes available then we would replace the money the town's using is normally what we would do Okay, I see both um, Mandy and Tammy had their hands up I didn't see which order they came in so um, I have one, one quick question about Pomeroy, which is not listed in here. Is this something that was approved before? And what's happening at the Pomeroy 116 intersection? So we received a Mass Works grant for $1.5 million for that intersection. So that project right now is 100% funded by it was 100% funded by a grant from the state. We do have to spend some engineering money and we'll spend that engineering money out of um, either chapter nine, probably chapter 90 to get the engineering plans finished for that. But that's almost all out of um, grant, state grant money. Can you just briefly say what, what you're doing there? Seeing as I live like right near Pomeroy Lane, I'm just curious. <laughs> the, proposal, the proposal is to improve the intersection. So we're going to be reaching out and talking to people and gathering information. What do you like about the intersection, which I think is a small list. What you don't like about the intersection, big list. 
Um, what do you do in the intersection? Why do you come to the, the village center? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to just go to one, one business or do you walk to one business and then walk to several other ones? Um, we need to know what people are doing there. So we're gonna try to collect all that information together and then we're gonna look at ways to solve it. And when we applied for the grant, we put two choices in there. We put putting a full intersection with turn lanes and traffic lights, and we put a second option of using a roundabout to do this. But the, the goal, I mean, the goal is to make improvements so people can use it and kind of bring, bring that little village center to life a little bit so you can move around between the four corners and feel comfortable moving around the four corners and that you wanna be in the four corners. Well, I'd like to have more cars going <laughs> down Palmer Way to 116 instead of going 50 miles an hour down Middle Street to Bay Road. So anything you can do to improve that to keep cars from going 50 miles an hour by my, by down Middle Street, which is not a great street. Um, it's been interesting that since the roundabouts at um, Bay Road, people avoid the intersection at Pomeroy because it's easy to get around Bay Road now with those roundabouts, but good. I'm, I'm I'm thankful for that and thank you for updating me. I somehow missed that. Hey, Thanks. Kathy, let, let me just speak real quickly. Um, it's been assigned to the town services and outreach committee of the uh, council to um, look at the alternatives and there are public forums set up by the, uh, that committee for I believe March 25th and March 27th, two different uh, and there's going to be a lot of publicity to try and make sure that um, the community and particularly uh, people who are in your um, district are aware of them. So, Kathy, thank you. Uh, and Tammy, if, if you didn't take notes and that, we can send you that information. So, uh, Mandy. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you. I think Kathy covered all my questions on the North Amherst intersection and the transportation plan. So that's fantastic. So I have one question that is an update on Station Road Bridge. I didn't see it in the five-year CIP. I know we got a grant. I believe the grant won't cover the whole thing, but I know we're also seeking another grant. But um, what's the timing on that in case we don't get that grant and we need more money in the capital improvement plan for it? And the next one is streetlights. Um, Streetlights can be very contentious sometimes. Um, you've recently heard from my husband about one that shines in our bedroom. But, um, you know, um, what is our, you know, you talked about in this, in the application for funding that there's a lot of people or there are requests for more lights um, for walking and streetscapes and biking and all. So I'm curious where what what our process is for determining whether we put in a street light is it that if one person requests it on a street we get a street light or does there is there a study that goes on so that it doesn't automatically go in how do you remove a street light if some light sometimes the neighborhood or people determine is there any process for determining whether street lights are no, no longer necessary um, and then another question is when I started thinking about how often these streetlights are on, it's like half the year, because many of you know, the winter months, it's like 15 hours a day or more. Um, and in the summer months, it's still a good 10. Um, so are there, you know, and to talk about an example that is I'm at the end of a cul-de-sac. There is no sidewalk on our cul-de-sac. There is a streetlight at the end of the cul-de-sac, not in the round part of this cul-de-sac, you'd actually hit some trees if you weren't paying attention and drove towards the streetlight. There's no one that walks there. So do we look at when someone, when, when the streetlight is potentially for car safety, do we look at non-electrified options for that, such as reflectors in the road or on the curbing or a reflective sign that would be illuminated by street, by cars? I say this because in um, Hawaii, there is a very long and curvy road that goes up to the top of the volcano where people pilgrimage for sunsets and sunrises. So you're either coming down in dark or going up in dark. And there is not a single light on that road. It is, but it is bright as anything because it is entirely reflective. And you could not drive off that road if you wanted to 
in terms of if you didn't lose control of your car and you're going slow enough because you're lit up like like a um, runway, frankly. So do we look at those options that are not electrified options when it's not needed for walking? And if there is a policy, who does it? Or if there's not a policy, who should be doing it? <laughs> so that we make decisions that are, you know, logical for where we're trying to go on climate action, but also safety and everything. That's a lot. It is, sorry. <laughs> so uh, I'll start with the policy. Um, there's an old select board policy that is why it's been the guide for street lights. Um, street lights were reduced about, I've been here I've been here almost 20 years and it was 20, so 40 years ago when people talk about the great two and a half debacle when people were laid off and street lights were turned off. Um, after that, they, the town count, the select board came out with a, a, a policy that said we'll have street lights in the, in the downtown area, the business areas. We'll have them at the end of cul-de-sacs, at the end, intersections of streets and on curves in the road. And so what we've been doing since we replaced all the older lights with new LED lights is um, the majority of the lights we put in now are in either the downtown area to illuminate downtown, or they're in the major areas where pedestrians are. Mostly the, the, most, the, the most recent lights we put in were on North Pleasant Street. So that's where we've been concentrating on. Um, no one has asked in a while and a long time to take one out. So I don't know how we would um, tackle that one. Um, we do need to start thinking about what we do for the next generation of lights and our next upgrade, our, our next major upgrade for lights. Um, do we go with the smart city, connected city versions where the lights actually talk to each other and you can program them to dim themselves down. You can program them to turn themselves off. And then when a car approaches, they can turn themselves on or a pedestrian approaches, they can turn themselves on. Um, th those, that, that conversation does need to be had at some point. And that does lead directly into what you're talking about, about the green communities and so forth. Um, I don't have a street light on my street and I love it. Um, I think I told your husband, we have some new neighbors from San Diego and they leave their lights on all the time and we're like, ah, um, it's really kind of disturbing. Uh, but for the out, outlying neighborhoods, we do need to have that, that discussion at some time about what do you want to do for the next generation of lighting in town? Um, so that, that's, I hope I answered your question. And that's kind of where we're going with street lighting. I think I have one more and, and you did generally answer it and it's about the LED lights that are going in. Um, I know we switched to LEDs in all street lights a while ago. Um, has that ever been reviewed in terms of whether people complained more with the LEDs or left less and you know technology for LEDs has even improved dramatically like what what's been going on with that in terms of blue you know LEDs are a little more blue than the yellow and and all of that can you just talk a little bit about how you evaluate all of that as you're putting new in the, the most interesting thing is that we're getting more the lights have been almost in for 12 years now um, so we converted to LEDs about 12 years ago maybe a little more uh, the most interesting thing is that the people who have concerns about them have, we're actually here when the lights were put in originally and there were no complaints when the lights were put in originally. Um, it seems to be either everything else is darkening down so the street light is the only thing left that's lit up and that's causing a concern. Um, so it's really kind of an interesting, it, it wasn't like we, we changed the lights and people were complaining a lot. Um, the complaints are started building now actually as people as either it's darker around the lights and the light's the only thing left. It's kind of interesting. It could be more awareness about just light pollution in general too. Yes, maybe. And can you talk about Station Road or I don't know whether that's town manager Bachelman or you? I kind of hoped you forgot. Um, <laughs> so yes, we have, a, we have a half million dollar grant from the state small bridge program to do Station Road Bridge. We've applied to another one. We think 
we, we've been told we have a really, really good chance. So we're kind of, we're kind of hanging our hat on the fact we get this other grant to do this project. Um, so if we don't get that, then we'll have to readjust and, and do something differently. Um, but it's uh, roughly a $1.2 million grant we applied for. Um, and we're hoping we do get it, so. So uh, Peter has had his hand up. Paul, did you wanna just speak to this point first? And I, I think uh, it's important. So many people are under the impression, oh, the temporary bridge will last forever. It can last a long time, but ultimately Mass DOT is gonna require us to put a permanent bridge in. And I think it's just you know fair to say that their standards are gonna be different than what the temporary bridge is there. And so it's gonna be a lot different looking when we have to do this replacement. Um, is that accurate, Guilford? Yes, it's going to be a it's going to be a nice large bridge. Peter. Yes. Yeah, so on the North Amherst intersection and streetscape, um, on the, and the, this idea that if we don't allocate this money now and next year, this two and a quarter million of borrowing, um, and if and it, then if we don't get a grant, then it pushes it out a number of years. Um, I mean, just my, my comment on that, I, I guess mostly to, to, to Mr. Bockelman, since this committee is advisory to Mr. Bockelman, is that that's, I would submit that that's something we should reasonably consider. And that would be suboptimal and that would disappoint people and that would be pain. But, but what, you know, in, in the grander context of the rest of the capital that we're talking about here and in the capital projects we're talking about and the operations budget, it's, it's not about what, what are all the reasonable things that we can do. It's, it's where do we spread the pain, right? And if, if we have such a constraint on, on, on borrowing and, and its impact and trying to get community support, um, uh, not just for the four capital projects, but for the things like um, Mr. Mangano mentioned about trying to get this, the roads paved before we, before we hit that, all these different values, I, I find it pretty hard to justify something that we might get a grant for. Right, it's something that I would consider a luxury, um, and it's um, uh, again, it's not because it's not something we should do, but we kind of have to accept that I think as a community and be transparent about that the pain is coming if we're going to do these projects, and it's not a matter of avoiding the pain; it's a matter of where are we going to intentionally take the hit, um, and and this is a kind of a large item um, that 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 I would would be up for consideration for that kind of thing, so. So, um, Mandy, it looks like your hand came back up. It, it did. Um, I paged down on my questions. And I have one question about the tree and ground one ton dump truck with a plow. Um, on the capital plan we were given, um, that one looked like it was an $80,000 request. And then, like four lines lower, there was a one ton dump truck four by four with plow, same description as the first one on tree and grounds, but for highway, that was $60,000 for FY23. And I'm trying to figure out why those numbers aren't the same. Why the tree and ground one throughout the whole capital improvement plan is $80,000 and the highway one throughout the whole capital improvement program is $60,000 when they're described the exact same way. <laughs> Yeah, Guilford and I can look at that. We tried to look in those out years and and make the vehicles consistent across different areas. But if we, if we miss that one, we can update it. Um, so we, did, we, we did we did update the plow it, figures this year. So is it sixty thousand or eighty thousand? Because the eighty thousands in this current fiscal year, but the sixty thousands on the out year, which would if it's really sixty thousand, would find us twenty thousand in this fiscal year. No, we, we, no it's most really... recent one was updated, so it might it may lose us. 20,000 in the out years. Um, Gilford, are those the same exact type of truck? They're, they're roughly the same truck. So the 60,000 is a price we had two, three years ago. Um, and the 80,000 is the current price. All right, so we will update that um, for the version you guys get at the end uh, for your discussion. And, and all the smaller trucks, just so you know, they're all, they're all gasoline powered. There, there is no hybrids, and and we actually, we actually got rid of our last hybrid recently. Um, they're all gasoline powered, unfortunately, and, um, and 
until uh, Tesla can figure out how to put a plow frame on the front of his Tesla pickup truck. I don't see one out there yet. Mandy? Yeah, sorry, that, that reminded me though, if Ford, if they have recently touted an intention to move their entire fleet, F-150s, all of it, F-3, whatever they are, <laughs> and even bigger ones, to um, all electric. Will that, if that happens, and it's like within three years or something, or five years, or some really quick number, if that actually happens, will that potentially allow us to be buying some of these trucks, these four by four one ton trucks, or or some of the smaller ones that maybe aren't one ton trucks, um, fully electric or hybrid? Um, possibly, we'd be able to do that. The, the only the only issue with our trucks is, and if you look at the if you look at the spreadsheet that was included with the vehicles, you'll see our mileages are so variable. Um, when we're driving a truck from the facility to a job site and then we work at the job site and drive back we get much better gas mileage than we do if we put a plow on it and push snow with the truck um, so what we're seeing on the construction and construction side is that they're coming up with electrical vehicles there's actually a small electrical excavator available right now um, it only works for it only works for um, eight hours um, and then you have to stop and recharge it um, for a snowstorm, we can't have a vehicle that stops at eight, at eight, at eight hours. Um, I think what we're going to find is that the, for these heavier vehicles, there's going to be some type of improved hybrid, hybrid type vehicle that does it, or maybe one of the companies that's working on the hydrogen fuel cells will actually, they'll actually be shifting more to a hydrogen based fuel instead of a, a gasoline or diesel based fuel. It's going to, it's interesting. The next five years is going to change how we have vehicles. Thank you. So any other questions? You know, I, I, I think it would be useful, Guilford, you said verbally what the, on the North Amherst intersection, just to have you write a little bit of more of a narrative of what you would do with that money you know, as opposed to thorough design because I think people were uh, on Pomeroy Lane people like the idea that the design of the specific is going to come after the discussions um, not precede it which um, buys people in so it is a big price tag and if we're not quite ready to have that um, it feels like that's an item that could potentially move one of the issues uh, I don't know how much this is being propelled by a potential large um, development coming in up here and increasing the traffic problems. And we don't know yet, it's this thing called the eruptor. And if we don't know yet how real that is, although they're saying it's real and that would suddenly increase traffic through a intersection that's already problematic. But again, uh, just something more on it that would um, ease people's fears rather than raise alarm bells that there's already been a decision on what to do. We, I can do that. There, there truly hasn't been a decision. Okay. And, and the, mo the biggest piece of the cost will be is if we decide that we want to do another traffic study based on the, the change in the intersection we've made now. We put one the new um, temporary light in. Um, do we want to study that? Do we want to gather data from that? That would be something that we would spend part of that money on. Um, yeah. no, way, no way would we spend $450,000 on it, but that's the, one, that's the one thing that's out there that does need to be wrapped up. Um, the other issue is, is we got to get rid of the, uh, the gas station. Um, who's who's going to get rid of the gas station? And this would probably, part of this money, not all of it would go towards removing the gas station as well. So there's prep work that can be, this money can go to as well as just tidying things up and then talking to people about, uh, we put the new light in, things seem to be working better. They're, they're working better than they did when it was just this type of light. Um, we've done a few other things. Those things have improved. That would probably be the only thing we would do with this money until we actually get to the point where people have made some hard and fast decisions where going with this type of intersection or this type of intersection. 
Okay. And that the new lights, you had told us the new lights can count, correct? Um, it can count cars, people, bicycles. It can, car, it can count cars. It does cars really well. We haven't purchased and installed the part that does the people and the bicycles yet. Okay. Because the students were on, because of the pandemic and students really aren't moving around very much down there, we kind of put that cost off. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions? Um, seeing none, I'm going to just quickly look to see whether we have no public attendees. So um, since there are, is no one in the audience, unless someone plans on phoning in, I think we have uh, completed tonight's agenda. Is that correct, Sean? So, so One again, thing, Kathy, are, have we decided? Are we going to uh, vote on minutes? Or are we just? Are you just going to approve them? I I, I think people were comfortable with me approving them, but I sent you this last set so you could see if there was anything missing. If people would like to actually spend time during a, a meeting reviewing minutes, be happy to do that. Um, otherwise, we can just keep this as a record. Um, and now that we have the recordings coming up, it should be easier to capture. I think we're trying to capture both the comments and answers that were given that goes beyond what we came up with the exhibit. So um, I think that was a plan uh, around minutes, unless anyone would like to bring minutes onto agenda for a discussion. I'm just looking around to see whether anyone is saying they want to make it as an agenda. We certainly can next time. We're, we're posting the draft minutes, so we won't be in the rears of having no minutes. I don't see any uh, thing. So looking at everyone, I think we're done for the evening. And thank you all for staying with us to this late hour, especially people who were coming from another meeting into this meeting um, or coming from a long week of meetings. So we'll see you all next week. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. Thank you.